What's up, guys? It's KB. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Click the bell icon down below so you don't miss a single video from us. And thanks for tuning in to another video from Underground Sports Philadelphia. Now let's get into it. Philadelphia, baby. You're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually the worst, but that's what makes them the best. Welcome back to Top Bins. Not just any episode of Top Bins. The 100th episode. I'm your host, Matt, joined by my co-host, Dom. Dom, how are you? Um, I'm feeling productive today, Matt. In Very. total dad mode, doing yard work <laughs> and then cracking open a cold one afterwards. You love to see it. If you don't know... You should already know. We bring you all the action from England and Italy, the Premier League, and Syria. The domestic club season, as it was, has concluded with the Champions League final, and then we had our relegation playoff in Italy. Hellas Verona are staying up in Syria. Spezia are going down to Serie B, which is surprising when you consider that Hellas Verona, for a large part of the season, were very, very bad. Um, have found a way to remain, and we will see them back again next year. Uh, Bari is actually returning to Syria as nice. well, uh, which is uh, which is an interesting one with Claudio Ranieri as well, a familiar face uh, returning to uh, Italian top flight. So let's get to the Champions League final, though. Obviously, the the big game over the weekend, the conclusion to the domestic club season, the biggest tr prize in all of Europe. It's captured by Manchester City, their first time winning the Champions League, and it completes their treble, a historic treble for sure. Uh, it was a interesting game. I didn't think it was the highest quality game that you've ever seen, but finals rarely are, especially Champions League finals. I think they, uh, a lot of times, I, I think can be a little underwhelming because the stakes are so high. The players are very aware of it. There's a, a really interesting atmosphere all the time at games like this. Um, I thought Inter were actually pretty good at limiting City's chances and opportunities. I think they had a, a pretty solid game plan. Uh, you know, they've been a, a team that has fared pretty well in cup competitions this season. You know, they already won Copa Italia, of course, and they had obviously a lot of success in the Champions League by making it to the final. And, you know, they've been a team all season we've talked about. Kind of beat anyone on their day, and I think maybe they'll feel a little, a little unlucky coming out of this game that they had opportunities I think everyone's going to especially latch on to that Romelu Lukaku header uh, that, uh, I don't know, if it goes three inches, uh, you know, uh, uh, to Ederson's left, it's probably a goal in the 90th minute and we're going to extra time and then who knows what happens. But um, I, I think a, a, probably a frustrating game for, for Inter fans because they really did limit City's opportunities. It was one of their lowest uh, shot totals of the season. They, they, they really didn't allow them in all that much. They were very compact, but... Uh, you know, City is ultimately their win. They created enough. They uh, they applied enough pressure to finally get that goal. No, it's kind of it's kind of crazy when you consider the fact that like Kevin De Bruyne goes off in the 35th minute uh, with an injury, uh, second Champions League final that he goes off injured in the first half. Uh, not the best track record for him, but you know that opened up some opportunities for for Inter, and they didn't capitalize in that first half. Uh, they allowed. Uh, City to get momentum back on their side a little bit. I mean, when you've got guys like Phil Foden and Kyle Walker coming off the bench for Pep, like it's it's crazy. Like we've talked about Manchester City's depth uh, all year, and I think that's what is the deciding factor in this game. Uh, I didn't get to catch the second half. I had, I had to work, and I had the Champions League game on. And and would you believe this? Uh, one of the one of the customers at the brewery was like. Uh, are, are we going to watch the Phillies today? The Phillies play the Dodgers and, and lose 8 nothing, like uh, over the biggest game in, in world football. Like it's, it's, It was crazy. But um, I didn't get to catch the second half, unfortunately, when all that yeah, happened. You got to catch the Phillies in uh, in mid June over the Champions yeah. League final. Oh, yeah. It was priorities. I was, I was pissed, man. I was pissed. But, you know, credit to credit to City. They did, they did the treble, they did it. Um, you know, there's some there's some participation trophies that Inter can take home with this. Like a chair, be uh, had Holland in his pocket the whole game and stuff like that. You know, I mean, he did. But yeah. He did. Like it's it, it's all you hear online now. It's like, oh, yeah, we may have lost the final, but Starboy, your your Ballon d'Or winner, is is getting blocked up by a chair, be. But you know, whatever. Uh, 
yeah, Inter's definitely unlucky. Uh, they definitely had some chances. Um, they played a good game. They, they, this, and, and I guess it's another final that kind of, you know, fits that narrative that you never have a good cup final, right? Everybody plays it so meticulously and afraid to make a, make a mistake because you get punished on the other end. So, uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of how Pep plays his game anyway. Uh, and, and Inzaghi on his day can have his team play the same exact way. So uh, a very, you know, hard fought, you know, kind of take your chances kind of deal. I mean, 14 shots for Inter to City 7, you know, City just wants to sit back and keep possession, even though they didn't have that much more in the game. So I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting, interesting game by the numbers. Uh, interesting game when, when you watched it. I thought it was still extremely entertaining, but. You know, I like I like watching high quality football. So, yeah, two uh, two great teams. I I think you got two two obviously with Manchester City, you're getting a, what was very clearly one of the best teams in Europe all season. And Inter again, you know, have been a very interesting uh, team all year in terms of their ability to win against the big clubs and the big opponents. Lest we forget, they had a very challenging group stage uh, that they had to navigate as well. Um, for City, you know, it's it's obviously a treble, and you know that that deserves to be celebrated, and it has. But I think it also comes with its own moral quandaries. You know, they still have these 115 charges kind of pending over them, and it is hard to when you talk about placing them uh, in the annals of history and comparing them to other treble winners, you know, uh, of decades gone by. It is a bit of a challenge because you don't know what part of this could be rescinded. You don't know what part of this has been stained by that um you know i i think that's that's always going to be a question mark with them whether city fans feel that's fair or not i i, I think it's fair to to question that um you know there's always going to be a lot of what about ism whenever you talk about these these state-backed clubs you're seeing it with newcastle as well you know that no matter what criticism you levy at them there's always going to be some excuse or some some what about uh you know this uh, that they're going to throw back at you but yeah i think it's worthy of that the, the players deserve it though um john stones was terrific you know and, and a lot has been discussed too about the the second half of the year and his new role playing in the midfield and how versatile he's been uh jack Grealish uh, really owning up to the celebrations he has uh, he's really lived up to his reputation in terms dude of proper proper english footballer right there had to be helped by kyle walker out of the hotel but, uh when kyle walker is, <laughs> is probably whispering in your ear that you overdid it uh you know it's, it's fair to question it's fair to question what what choices you've been making recently so kyle walker not always the voice of reason not always the arm around your shoulder that yeah that you necessarily want because if he is helping you along I think you've done some damage uh, to yourself See, and maybe to others. Look, I mean, it, it, it's kind of been like a stereotype for for English footballers in the past, right? Like in in the in the eighties, the nineties, the early two thousands, you had these like big name like uh, English footballers, and and they'd be some of the best in the world, but they're also going to go out and party their asses off. I mean, it was it was the stereotype that they used for. You ever see the movie Goal? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you know the like Eng the the English guy that like is is on the team with him, and and he's just like the proper party guy, even though he's like the star of the team. Like it, Jack Grealish is just that classic English English player that just <laughs> he'll he'll bag a goal or an assist or just do some some stuff that's nice for the eyes to watch, and then <laughs> goes on a bender. <laughs> Listen, he's always been a guy that says he loves to go out and have a drink with his boys, and uh, you know, a drink. <laughs> well, a drink. I think maybe he said some drinks, but uh, yeah. Manchester City uh, cap off a, a a great season for them. Uh, you know, again, a, a treble is no small feat. You know, no English team has done that since, of course, Manchester United in 1999. I'm sure United fans are so happy that they were cheering on this freight train of Manchester City over the last four or five seasons when they were competing with Liverpool. And now the most notable achievement uh, that they have achieved over the last like 40 years uh, has been eclipsed by their city rivals. I hope they enjoy it. I hope they enjoy every second of it. I hope it's worth it. Uh, congrats to them. Pep, the only manager to do the treble twice. I'm pretty uh, sure, right? Yeah, and uh, especially with two different teams, and he joins Zidane and Paisley, and then Carlo Ancelotti has won four, but those are the only managers to have won three or more uh, Champions League or European Cups. So yeah, 
I mean, he was already in elite territory, but you know, he's uh he's really put himself amongst the, the the greatest of all time, especially the greatest among European competitions. Shout out to uh, Carlo Ancelotti, just still, just king. My shit. guy, loved it. my know, guy. You love and also hate to see it, <laughs> me, but I've had a I've had a mixed. I've had a mixed experience through my life with Carlo Ancelotti. He's, <laughs> he's given me some of my best and some of my worst. So. Well, you know, we're turning the page on the season and starting to look forward to next year. And, you know, we're obviously going to start talking about transfers. Last year we did a segment, and we'll be returning with this, but I just wanted to, you know, with the limited time that I had to at least talk about one player and talk about some other transfer news. Uh, last summer we did five players from each league that could be on the move, and we gave you a point or weaknesses do we think maybe they should move or should you know maybe would they benefit from staying another season where they might fit um you know just to give people an idea you know because we hear these names constantly you know parried about and then when they do make their their uh their switch you're obviously going to get a positive very positive spin from the new club we're going to give you a much more neutral view but we're going to start today you know we, we don't have that exact segment this episode we'll have it next week for you but I wanted to talk a little bit about Mason Mount because this is a guy that I think has been on a, a lot of people's tongues over the last four or five months because it became clear that he was not going to be resigning with Chelsea and that he only has a year left on his contract now. So Chelsea seems like they are more interested in selling him this summer rather than you know letting him walk for free. He's been closely linked with Manchester United. He was uh, linked with Liverpool a lot, too, uh, during the season. That seems to have cooled off. Um, Manchester United, though, are, are trying to sort of whittle down the fee. Um, it's interesting because, obviously, you know, he didn't have a, a great season at Chelsea. I don't think a single Chelsea player did have a good season besides, like, Thiago Silva. I think it was the only one that could, that walks out of uh, this past season. Like, well, that went okay for me. Uh, <sighs> You know, so Mason Mount, I think, you know, had a down year in, in terms of production, especially goals and assists. And I, I think had a, a tough time, too, when you consider that um, the formation changes and you obviously had a managerial change uh, a few times this season, which is always tough on, on any player, but especially a player like Mason Mount, who, and for my money, has never really had like a super established position. He's kind of found found himself on like a an inside forward or an attacking mid. Um, he's he's kind of one of these players that I don't know has like a an established spot. Um, he's great off the ball movement. You know that's reflected in his goal scoring numbers. The fact that he's a midfielder that can get you double digit goals um, is not all that common. You know it's it's not quite Odegaard like we saw this season, but he has this great way of like sweeping the ball into the net. He's not like a powerful shooter he's not like your kind of great imperious midfielders of old that is launching it from 30 yards into the 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 top bins trademark um you know he's a lot of times just finding himself in good positions and and towing it home or again he has this lovely like kind of sweeping shot that he does um and i, I think that's kind of representative of, of him as a player too that he's never quite been and doesn't really quite seem to me to be like the top dog you know He's obviously, naturally, anytime you have like a gifted English Premier League midfielder, he's going to get compared to Gerard and Lampard. That is, that is just the litmus test for mm -hmm. players. Um, and it's going to be for probably another 10, 15 years still. Um, doesn't quite have the mentality, it seems, of those guys. Doesn't quite have the talent. He's not a box-to-box -box type of player, though. He's more, like you said, the advanced type of midfielder more of a I'm talking 10. just in terms of like his talent level I, I I'm saying he's, he's okay. not really yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. not really in that sphere uh yeah it's certainly tactically I don't think those players Mason Mount has like drifted deeper at times but I do think he's probably better operating in the final third this was like a big issue with me for them bringing Connor Gallagher back last year is Connor Gallagher is just a tier below but is in the very much the same mold as Mason Mount and I had a really hard time understanding what his role was going to be at Chelsea I, I really think he would have benefited from staying out on loan again whether that was at Crystal Palace or wherever um, I, I just think it was a mistake for him because I, I, those players to me are just kind of similar in in a lot of ways um, yeah but you know I, I just think he is a he is not a like statement player. He's not a player that I think is going to really lift up the team and be built around him. He's not one of these midfielders that I think you build around. I think he's a great complementary piece. I think he would go to a club and be a great you know third option in that midfield, second option in that midfield, um, a great like linking player, complementary player. I do not think this is a guy that you sign and is like the statement signing. And that's where I think this is going to get tough for Mason Mount because Chelsea are not going to sell him for cheap necessarily. 
either, either the price being quoted for him is 70 million. That is a high and steep price. And I don't think people are going to pay that, especially when you consider he has a year left on his contract. Um, and it is hilarious because Chelsea are part of the reason why the, especially the midfield, uh, you know, uh, transfer market is so inflated because they've spent uh, crazy. But, you know, when you see Jude Bellingham going for 88 million, you know, obviously that could rise and you have some, some wages to consider there, but it's not hard to consider how paying seventy million for Mason Mount feels a little, uh, a little, a little much, a little steep. I don't know if England is. I, I think he would do well with a move abroad. I mean, there's not a lot of teams that can afford, you know, what Chelsea will probably ask for him. And there's and no, I'm not going to pay him the wages. Yeah, that he's going to want. It, it's 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 kind of like a lose lose in his aspect. Like he's falling out of touch with Chelsea. But like, what Premier League team really needs a player of like his mold right now? Like, and like you said, it's not really like he's a number ten, but he's not like a false nine. But he doesn't really go out wide, and sometimes he drops back and plays like an eight. But like, it's 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 really weird. Like, I. There's only a couple teams that you can really say like he can go to, right? I mean, like City can obviously afford him, but they have a specific project, and I don't think he fits in there. Uh, United, but they have guys that do what he does, so like I don't see that happening. I don't. I couldn't see him going to Spurs. I I don't think Arsenal would, would sign him. They've got Odegaard, so I don't. I, Liverpool. Is, it does is, not is, does not seem there, they signed they signed McAllister so there you know it seems like the other midfield options that we're going towards are more of your like athletic types guys that are going to be able to carry the ball and yeah. provide a little bit of like physical profile because that's what we're lacking in the midfield right now I, I think so um, and and Mount is not you know he's not a he's not a like imperious midfielder in that way um, again I. I don't want to say he's a luxury player. I just think he's he's gonna. It's gonna be interesting to see where he does end up. United does seem the most likely spot. That's the team he's been linked to the most. It still seems like they're trying to negotiate some kind of deal. But yeah, I, I don't know where you know any options abroad. I honestly don't know. I don't think there's an. <laughs> there's not a single Italian club that would uh, be able to afford. No it. Italian no. club has money this summer, which is going to be something we have to discuss. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the coming weeks, because none of them can spend any money. I uh, thought Milan's. I thought Milan's situation was bad. But. <laughs> two of like the top six have like crippling debts and need to sell uh, this summer. And I mean, just like a sell to buy type of thing, where they're on this like you know program of, of being sustainable. Like no, like they need to come up with 150 million. Uh, this summer because they they're operating at such extreme losses so that's going to be something for them to uh, to kind of consider at least yeah. we'll see maybe Bayern come calling who knows you know Bayern are definitely looking to to maybe add to the midfield um I can't see anyone in Spain I, I don't think Madrid or Barcelona are necessarily so who knows who knows where Mason Mount well, ends up but yeah but Madrid brought two players over already for the midfield they recalled uh, Brahim and brought him back, who is kind of the same mold as Mason Mount, right? He's the Spanish Mason Mount. He doesn't really fit into a specific spot. He can do a couple of different roles. Um, doesn't get the same goal scoring output, but, you know. And then they brought Jude Bellingham. So, I mean, like, do you really need to spend even more money on another English midfielder that'll probably just be a rotation guy? I... Lord knows. Lord only knows. I would love, I would love if maybe they would cast off, uh, you know, Chuameni or Valverde. I would, I would take either of them in an absolute heartbeat. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our thoughts on Mason Mount. Let's, let's talk a little bit about transfer, shall we? Because we've had some confirmed ones. Um, these two are, are interesting Two two free midfielders. Yuri Tillman's going to Aston Villa. Real G's move in silence. Aston Villa this, always come up with big signings. Um, that just come out of nowhere. This is very good for I think it's a big signing in that it's a big name. I don't think Yuri Tielemans is that good. That is like I, I think he's I think he's been a guy that has played at the top level since he was sixteen. And so everyone has known him for like a decade and he's had some some good moments at Leicester. Um I do think one, he's had a ton of minutes for his age. He sort of had a, he has a false age, and then he's not really in his mid twenties, he's more like in his late twenties in when you really think about the amount that he's point. played. Didn't love his past season, and there was a lot to not like about pretty much every Leicester situation this past year, and some of that is out of his control. But I didn't like the attitude stuff. I didn't like that he was clearly, you know, packing it in. I get being frustrated because he wanted to move, say, to like a club like Arsenal, but 
also concerns me that Arsenal decided he wasn't worth it past summer, um, you know, for a pretty cut rate price as well. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't think he's like a, he's not a particularly mobile midfielder. You know, he's, he's sort of like a static passer, uh, more of like a tempo guy. And I just don't, I don't love the fit. I, I don't think he's that great. I, I think he's, I don't want to say he's overrated, but I just, I think people give him a little more shine than maybe he deserves at times. And I think people are like quick to praise him. I think people are very like locked in on like the year and a half for Leicester where they win the FA cup and stuff. And like, he's sort of in the middle of that and have sort of made that the image of Telemans. And I'm just not sure that's who he is anymore. I think that for Villa, at least you're bolstering your midfield with a guy with good experience. One of the more talented guys from a lesser team. And I think for Telemans, like, Considering all the things that you just said, right, uh, with his season, with, you know, given how bad Leicester City was and, and you know, the fact he has a lot of miles on his legs and this and that, like, he's obviously not going to take a step up into one of the top, like, five clubs in the, in the league. But I think that, you know, for him to get his career back on track and, and, and be a, a very solid, you know, Premier League player, Villa is kind of the right move for him. Right. Uh, you know, being another guy, you know, we just talked about Mason Mount with this, like he's another one of those guys that's going to, you know, cost an exuberant fee for teams abroad. So like he's going to make a move within the league. So it's kind of like, all right, if you're on a relegation team, you have your choice. You're either going to go to the bottom, you know, third team, a bottom third team or a middle third team. And, and Villa is right on that, you know, bubble of you know hey, being in the be top in third they're gonna, they're gonna be, be in europe, europe. so that so technically actually they're a lower top tier team you know so it's it's the low end i love your tiers the low your tiers are very good I you know the third the top the first third the top third they're the low end they're on that bubble right so truly truly a beautiful mind uh hey hey listen i'm not a professional we just we just talk every wednesday about soccer <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I have a math I have a math degree, not a journalism degree. Very true. Um I do think Telemans is, is fine. I just think people are like people really overreacted to this. Like it was you know, I I don't know. I I don't think it's that crazy. Like it's Pirlo uh, going to Juventus type. Right. Like yeah. Asamawar to Roma, uh, also on a free transfer. This is one of the most hyped midfield prospects, kind of similar to Telemans, honestly. Uh, if you go back three four seasons this was a guy that was on everyone's wish list uh you know ever everyone wanted and just sort of faded i've heard a lot from leon fans that he sort of had uh you know like uh motivation issues and didn't seem all that all that bothered at times and he never really kind of progressed to the next level uh his career stagnated a little bit i don't think it's a bad signing for roma you know maybe they, a change of kinda... paces was what, what he's needed I'm interested to see him work with Mourinho. You know, Mourinho has the ability to definitely get the, the most out of players and maybe revitalize a career here. Um, I don't think it's a bad deal for Roma at all when you consider it's a free transfer. You know, they they, they do not have a lot of money to spend. Um, you know, and so that's, that's the one good side of this deal. Roma is doing wonders in the transfer market right now with, with these free signings. They Not only did they bring in Semawar, but they brought in uh, Evan and Dicka. Right. I don't uh, think that's confirmed yet. Um, uh, but he like he has been I heard I heard that's very advanced, at least. Yeah, but, I've heard that's very advanced too. I saw it yeah, on Twitter, so it's very like, it's extremely it's advanced scouting. talks. But uh but you know, you're seeing all these people uh uh linked to Roma as opposed to all these other teams. Um and they're not even in the Champions League. It's the Mourinho effect, I guess. Like they're not even in the Champions League this year. And they're the ones in Italy right now bringing everybody in. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, he's he's still a very, like, effective passer. Um, and I, I think, you know, that's that's something that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot was made of, of Roma's sort of, you know, goal scoring issues last year. This is a guy that could probably unlock some defenses for you. Um, still has, like, some good all-around stats, too. Um, still a pretty good dribbler as well. So um, again, you know, I, I I think it's it's a it's honestly a, a pretty decent signing. It's it's kind of worth taking a, a shot on. You know, see if you can kind of get him to be continually motivated. And well, and considering so, your other some of your other center midfielders are prone to getting injured every now and then. I mean, when all of them is coming off of a pretty serious injury, uh, Cristante doesn't always stay too healthy. So uh, it, it's a it's a nice kind of like insurance 
signing, right? You, you increase, you know, your midfield numbers and, you know, it helps with squad rotation. It gives you other options uh, for, for how to set up your, your starting 11. And, you know, so I, I think it's a good signing for Roma. Yeah. I, I like our, I, I I'm, I'm interested to see how that works. Some rumors, Declan Rice and Kai Havertz to Arsenal. Uh, Declan Rice has been rumored for a little bit. Kai Havertz, it seems like by people, that's, that's by recent, time people yeah. listen to this, this could be done. Um, it's, it's really advanced in the last day. Um, Declan Rice, I love. I, I've been a big fan of Declan Rice for two years now, honestly. I've, I've really liked him. I think um, he's a very good midfielder. I think it's strange because he sort of gets overrated at times because he's English, but also underrated at times because he's English. Like, English players have this this weird thing about them sometimes with uh, the way that they're valued and the way that they're perceived. But I think Declan Rice is a very good midfielder. And I honestly, like, if we were a, a fabinho list team, I, I would probably be interested in Declan Rice at Liverpool. Like, I, I do think he's a very good player. Um, he's a, a great skill set for the position. And I think if Arsenal do sign him, especially as a Xhaka replacement, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good replacement to have. Um, Kai Havertz is... A- I feel like that's a luxury signing for them. Like... <laughs> I agree, and I so I I really loved Kai Havertz coming out of Germany. I was a huge fan. Um, he was really he actually, good. He visited Liverpool when he was like seventeen, and this was like when he first came over. I was like, I need I need this guy immediately. So I've I've followed his career with like a lot of interest, and it just has not clicked for him at Chelsea um, for any like extended period of time. He's had a few like months where it seems like he started to get it figured out. The problem is is. You know, we talked about this with Mason Mount. I think it's even more so for Havertz in that he's this type of player that really needs a lot of freedom and it's not like an assigned nine or ten. Um, and it's just sort of a free floating, almost secondary striker. It's kind of funny because he signed Jao Felix uh, on loan, and Jao Felix is kind of the same way in that he's sort of a, a good support striker. I don't know if he's enough to lead the line on his own. He's good with like players that you can play in behind or more like technical guys. Like, I just. <laughs> I I really am curious to see how that would fit at Arsenal. Um, and I'm just, you know, he's going to cost them, I think, around like 60 or 70 million. That's a pretty steep price for a guy that has not really shown a lot at Chelsea. Again, you've seen flashes, but for that type of money, you'd be hoping for something a little more concrete than what you, you're potentially getting with Kai Havertz. And this is coming from someone that is uh, not quite an apologist, but at least still holds some like stock in Havertz. I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how that works. I don't know what that looks like. And I, I think it's it's a bit of a risky move. I think considering the way that Arsenal play, a lot of their goal scoring output comes from their wingers. Uh, you know, Saka and Martinelli do a lot of goal scoring for them. And I think that having one of those strikers that can kind of drop into the midfield a little bit and, and, and play somebody in behind, I think could be a weapon for them. So I don't see this as something that, uh, no, sorry. Let me let me rephrase that. There's potential for the transfer if it goes through to be successful. Um, I mean, you could, Arsenal's again like one of those teams that can have a bunch of different looks based off of how they set up, right? If you have Gabby up front, you know they they can play a lot more direct. But if they have somebody like Cap Havertz up front, now you you're playing more of a false nine role. He's dropping in probably playing some one twos with uh um Odegaard to to you know release the wings into one on one situations and uh play a lot more counter attacking. So I don't know. Like I said, I think it's a luxury signing, but it it, it, it could work out. I think the the Declan Rice one is is really interesting. If he's a, yeah. if he's Jaka's replacement phew. I mean, a, a lot of people like I, I, I like how you said he was overrated and underrated because a lot of people still think of him as just like, you know, the quintessential like defensive midfielder. But he was one of us or one of West Ham's like most advanced midfielders, too. Like he took a lot of dribbles forward. He he got into the offensive third, was was shooting the ball, was making key passes. Uh, I think he has another dimension to his game like he's. He's more than like a Sergio Busquets type guy who kind of just sits back and pings passes and and is an enforcer in the midfield. Like you kind of mentioned Fabinho. Fabinho did did get forward a little bit, but you know, he's another one of those guys that kind of, you know, bosses the midfield like a, like a Fabinho Casemiro type guy. But I think Decky is a little bit better than that. Like he, 
moves up and 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 can add that extra threat, which for Arsenal, imagine, imagine, right? Like yeah. Jacques is one of those guys that sits back and just pings the passes. He doesn't always get up. And adding that extra dimension, phew, just another option, just another thing that defenses are going to need to worry about. Uh, I like seeing Arsenal take the transfer market a bit serious now that they got a taste of like the chance that, you know, the possibility of being able to, you know, say, Hey, we can compete with city. We can, we can, you know, do this thing. Let's, let's be serious and do this. Yeah. I, I think Declan Rice is a, a great like ball carrier as well. Like someone that can, that can definitely progress the ball for you. Um, Caverts, I, I think if, and it seems like the plan might be to play him in midfield in some way. Um, and, and I, I don't know. I, I again, it, it it strikes me as a little odd, um, and the the price. I don't know that I'd love that either, but uh, you know, we'll we'll see. It's it's a, it's a big bet. We'll see if it pays mm-hmm. off. Di Maria, uh, gone after one year at Juventus. This was one of my guys from last summer that I I thought someone should really take a chance on. Um, mixed bag at Juventus. Didn't really have the best time. Um, had some injuries to deal with. Obviously had uh, the World Cup, and he had a good time there. But yeah, just uh, not a not a great season for him individually and for the club as a whole. Um, curious to see where he ends up. That that could be something to to monitor at least. He's getting towards the end of his his years, though, right? Like I didn't think he was terrible when he played this year. Um, I, I think he's still something to offer at like the top level. I I don't know if he's like a regular yeah, but not for a, like no, starter. But I I think he, he you th- you think for a top league. team? I think he could still play. Yeah, I think he's still capable of those performances. Okay, I don't. I don't know. I, I I think I I do I do agree that you know he had a tough year. You know, given you know the situation at Juventus, Juventus didn't really have the best of years. Uh, there was some disconnect with Allegri and how he wanted to, you know, have them play, which is which is odd too because you know Allegri loves his like old guard type guys, but you know when you're dealing with injury issues and you're not consistent. It's tough to get going. It's tough to get going. I agree. Uh, this is an interesting inflection point for Juventus because they obviously are not going to have uh, Champions League revenue for next year. Apparently, they need to make up about $100 million in player sales. Guys like Chiesa and Vlahovic uh, mm-hmm. are going to be at least entertained for sale. Uh, they put Rugani up, who's been up for sale from Juventus for like six years now, I swear. Suchesny even, uh, apparently is uh is cleared for sale uh alexandro the, the, there's a, a a pretty long laundry list of, of guys that uh, are they liquidating the older guys or are guys like fagioli up as well no i can't imagine them party with with someone like fagioli no shot i i think you you do not uh you don't you don't move away from like young players that you've started to bet in this year but i think it's all about trying to get players that have some value or at least you can get their wages off the books um you know it's it's going to be like cost saving uh, but apparently they're not interested in like it's not a fire sale uh, you know that they're not uh, they're not going to entertain like low ball offers and things like that, uh, but it it is something to consider that Juventus you know could, they've got to uh, be in a worse place than Inter though. Like Inter has a zero, they have like a like a you can only buy if you sell type budget. This transfer Inter market. has I think a much worse financial situation in that uh, a principal investor of theirs has defaulted on a two hundred fifty million dollar loan. It's bad, um, and so. <laughs> Juventus, you know, it seems like are not going to be, you know, big movers and shakers. Who knows what's going to happen with Paul Pogba even, right? Um, you know, if, if that uh, if that continues on, um, you know, yeah, it's it's those two Italian clubs I think are, are going to be interesting to watch in the transfer market. I almost choked today because I was, I was scrolling uh, Twitter and there was a story about Newcastle United signing yeah. Nico Barella for $50 million. And I, almost I saw 70. Up. I saw it 70. Was 50, it was 50 million. Uh, this was like the confirmed report. It turns out it's not true. It's bullshit. Um, because if he was going for 50 million to Newcastle, there's about 17 other clubs that would be calling and saying, we would love one Nico Barella for 80 million. You know, like, no shot. Um, and I, I was so would be surprised. all over that too. Yeah. I was so surprised at that because there's just no way Inter are selling him probably for anything honestly but he, for 50 million is obscene like no shot is he is he he's worth he's worth double that yes especially to enter no no chance no chance it, if he sold it is not going to be for 50 million and i 
be kind of surprised if it was to Newcastle, to be honest. It's certainly possible. It'd be a big statement signing. But, um, yeah, Inter and Juventus, I think you're both going to see some departures. Inter are trying to work out a way to get Lukaku still. <laughs> they're also, I think they're also looking uh, to deal Skriniar still. Uh, when that, P- that PSG move fell through, and, and I think they're still trying to get rid of him. I don't think anyone understands what's going on with Screen Yard. Apparently, they're also, also interested in trying to work out a way to get Koulibaly on loan from Chelsea as part I did of the Lukaku that, yeah. thing. It, it, it is going to be... Uh, they're going to have to get a little... I don't know. A little high-wire act, I think. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Dom. I don't know if this makes you feel Mike Magnon, apparently. Uh, oh, it's not going to happen. Linked to Chelsea. No. no. Heck no. It's not going to happen. Okay. And and if so, Moncada okay. has... Moncada must have somebody that they're bringing in. It's... it's but heck no, heck no. This it would be so counterproductive for what they've got building right now. Okay. And 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 we'll the other thing in. is the other thing is that Chelsea will lowball Milan for Mike, and they'll sell him for less than he's worth. And I am I not, am, I, am I coping? Spiral. Am I coping? Milan spiral. I was just, Is that what I'm doing? Sort of, that doing that <laughs> a familiar face, a familiar neck tattoo could be returning to Italy. Um, if only he had taken my advice last summer when I told him um, and Osiman to stay one more year in Syria at least, and it would be much more beneficial for their life. One of those men took my advice. One of those men did not. Gianluca Scamacca, welcome back, brother, to Italy. Um, Seems like Roma could be the, the, the destination for him. Uh, Milan are also interested. Uh, Roma, obviously, Tammy Abraham torn ACL. Uh, you know, that, that really messes up, I think, their plans because Tammy could have been out this summer. Uh, but they're going to have to get a little creative and, uh, you know, try and finagle something with Skamaka, whether it's a loan or, or, or whatever. Uh, Milan could definitely use a, a striker as well. I, I think that that's something that is on their list for this summer uh, in addition. So Skamaka, is I it- think if he... Go ahead. Go ahead. Skamaka, if, if he returns, I, I think it'd be a good thing for him on, on a personal level. I think, again, you know, we saw him in Italy uh, with Sassuolo. He was, he was a, a good. above average striker. I think he has the potential to be better than that. Um, but, you know, he's, he's going to have to really uh, progress and develop over the next few years if he wants to really reach his potential. Um, again, don't think he should have left, but it is what it is now. I do think returning to Italy would probably be the best move for him. Isn't his dad his agent? Skamaka? I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Well, I know that his dad causes all that drama. Uh, where was that at? Was that at Sassuolo? Uh, where he, like, came in and started just, like, tearing things up? And, like, I forget. There were there were, there was some incident where his dad came to the training grounds and offices and started just Breaking causing a scene. Breaking news from Dom. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> I, don't, I, I would love I would love to see him in red and black, but I, if is if his dad's gonna cause drama because of playing time or something, then well, I'll tell you this: and... he's starting every game for you because I don't know what striker <laughs> you have that's playing above him. So I'll say that he's he's old. He knows how to scorpion kick, and yeah. uh, okay, sure. He, he was one of our leading goal scorers yeah, this year. Yeah. Uh, play Giroud for another 40 games and, and see how that works out for you. See if, uh, see if you achieve your goals with, with Giroud leading the line, playing 2,500 minutes. That, tell me how that works out for you. Yeah. Um, I think it's only fitting, and I think this guy knew it, that on our 100th episode, uh, we get to say goodbye to a legend, not just of the game, but of the political and cultural scene in Italy. Um, Silvio Berlusconi passed away. Uh, a honestly terrible person, one of the one of the worst human beings in existence. Um, I'm mean, gonna be honest; the world is not gonna miss what a total jackass and racist misogynist he was. Um, all that said. Uh, he did make you laugh sometimes, and he uh, he was influential, obviously, in uh, in Syria, very influential with soccer clubs, of course, owning your Milan, and now Monza, although, of course, no longer. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Monza, of course, because it felt a little bit like a pet project of his. Dom, I, I think you had a, a closer attachment to Mr. Berlusconi than, than I did. Um, Mira. Uh, attaccare! Uh, just pure banter era. Just, I, I love it. Just, um, 
I said this on Twitter, you know, the man, the politician aside, you know, if we look past all that, this may be one of the most successful owners in European football ever. I mean, if you look at how many Champions League trophies, like, he's brought to Milan and, and a few Scudetti and, and Coppa Italia and Club World Cups and all this other stuff. Just, you know, Milan was, was kind of like on the fringe of like being great and he bought the team and funneled all this money in, you know, whether, you know, legally or illegally, but they just became something different and, and something great. And, you know, it was a shame to see him leave. Uh, I think it was time to part ways. Uh, things were going downhill with the club. And, you know, that, that clip that I just played, that was, was, <laughs> it was one of the peak moments in the early days of, of their, their downfall, you know, but uh, it was nice to see him, you know, uh, purchase Monza and, and do what he did with them. Uh, but it's also, you know, a shame that, he had to pass and uh now you know what was a very successful season for them who knows what the future holds uh i hope he rests in peace i don't want to say that he was a completely good man but uh, <laughs> uh he will be missed at least in the world of football uh nothing was better than you know a milan goal being scored and and it cuts to the to the owner's box and you see him and Galani just screaming at the top of their lungs, just jumping up and down, holding each other. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I did hear what, isn't it? Uh, Saudi investors are looking at Monza or, or uh, I forget what the, what, what's being entertained. More I saw something at this point. But I can't. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's going to be owned by Saudi Arabia in the next ten years. So, good luck. Nah. Like, uh, like half our water supply in the uh, in the southwest is owned by Saudi. Arabia. It's fine though. It's all good. Totally sustainable. Yeah, that's that's totally, totally okay. Totally right? It's all going to be good. Don't worry about it. Don't don't think about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Berlusconi. I think I saw a, a quote from Twitter. Again, not a not a nice man. Very crude in many ways. Um, but sometimes you got to laugh at the crudeness because it's so just obscene. Uh, he was talking about uh, homosexuality and saying that everyone's a little homosexual. Like for me, I'm a little bit lesbian because I love women. Um, <laughs> just. Oh, my God. Just, uh, just an absolute guy. Uh, one of what, the people of all time. for sure. What was it? He was having like an affair, but it was like called a bunga bunga. His like bunga thing. bunga parties. Yeah, yeah his bunga uh, bunga parties. Where he would, uh, <laughs> by the way, you know, underage girls were implicated in those. So, yeah. Again, really honestly, just a shit person. Um, <sighs> but I think because he's a little goofy. Uh, just remind us of anyone, you know, just because he says some funny things that everyone kind of excuses his uh, his behavior. <laughs> hey, um, now <laughs> we're spiraling. <laughs> uh, listen, I'm just saying, uh, I, you know, be careful of <laughs> who you uh, you idolize because they're, they're probably a terrible, terrible person. Uh, hey, be careful; we may we may get uh, boycotted. <laughs> please, <laughs> boycotted and canceled. <laughs> Tom, anything to say before we get out of here? Uh, I did, and I can't remember. Um, but uh, Kyle sent this this info over to us. Um, formal, 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 uh, former Crystal Palace manager, uh, but more more notably Whoa, Arsenal. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, the uh, Arsenal legend Patrick Vieira is interested in the U.S. men's national team head Juventus coaching legend position. Patrick Vieira. It doesn't. No, let's not. Let's not say that. He's. I, I would consider him more. NYCFC a, legend. Patrick yeah. yeah, Vieira. yeah. <laughs> there we go. Crystal Palace cult hero, Patrick. Uh, Play, played five him. games for AC Milan. <laughs> I would not hate him at all for the U.S. national team. Um, I think that would be really good for them. But I will. Uh, I believe when I see it. I, I, I don't know what they're doing with Greg Berhalter just yet. Um, a lot of the players want Greg back. Uh, he seems to be like a, a pretty popular figure amongst them, except for Gio Reyna and his parents. But 
um, outside of that, I, I think everyone seems pretty cool with Greg. So, I, I, I th- do like Vieira though. I, th- I think he's good. I think with with the growing number of uh, European born U.S. nationals that are that are playing at, at like higher level like academies or with 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 top you know, flight teams in whatever country they're playing in. Like, I think that a change may be necessary. I mean, Balogun has, you know, pledged his loyalty to the United States and there's other players doing the same. So maybe a change is different and maybe, or maybe a change is needed and Vieira could be that guy. But who knows? Like you said, a lot of guys like Greg, so. Something to monitor. Something to monitor for sure. We will be back next week talking about some players that you'll be hearing about all summer long and we'll be informing you so that you already know a little bit about them before you read someone's uh, Twitter thread on why they're perfect for whoever you'll know you'll already know just a little bit what makes them special what makes them unique and why someone's going to pay like 90 million for them you'll, you'll already know this stuff you're welcome for free we give this to you no worries don't worry about it Dom I will see you then. I will talk to you all then. Until then, I, I don't know. Stay safe. What Here's to 100 episodes. Here's to 100 episodes. Just about two years worth of content. You love – you. there's nothing you love more than wrapping it all up and saying it like it's a year and a half worth of content. That's two years worth of content. That is your favorite, that is your favorite thing to do. You love – you love nothing more than that. Well, listen, when, when you look at it and, and you look at the amount that we've been putting in and it really doesn't feel like it. It doesn't. Uh, it feels like it. It feels like we've done 100 <laughs> episodes. I feel like we've done 100 <laughs> Well, I mean, in comparison to what you've done with the main show, I mean, like, feels yeah, like, this feels is. Like I've, feels yeah. like I've done 100 here. Yeah, okay. I'll do 100. Fair enough. Me. I'll stick around. Stick around. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right everybody thank you guys for tuning in uh, we'll see you guys next week that was pretty good yeah <laughs>